want to we the, the area shown in red around Loch Lomond and the Clyde estuary there is the area adopted by our society, which is only four years old. And you can see where the, the, the positions marked M are. These are various military positions which we are in the course of or having surveyed. You'll also note the existing military installations of Coolport, Fastlane and Glen Douglas, and then the old torpedo range up in the Loch Long. But for the purposes today, I'm only going to be talking about the southern tip of Rosneath Peninsula, which is the map on the right-hand side, because it's got a remarkable legacy of military remains uh, beginning in the late 19th century. Now, working back in time from the Cold War, we initially went to survey a gun site, HAA gun site, which we thought was World War II, and so did the owner of the site, in fact, and everybody in the district, uh, because they had no recollection uh, of anything else, uh, any later uh, structures being built. But in fact, it turns out to be a Cold War site. And what you see here is it's, a, it's entirely subterranean. It's been built under the ground, and you can see on the left-hand side there partial remains of the, the massive gun pit, and on the right, the roofs of the various buildings uh, in the site here. Now, of course, you just walk right across them. So we cleared bits off in various areas in order to do survey um, parts of the four uh, gun positions. And you can see we stuck the camera down a hole bottom right hand side there and it does show a massive chamber underground, unfortunately for us almost completely flooded. And you can see the extent of one of these sites in the right hand photograph there because one gun site extends right through that photograph. They're massive sites. So here's the survey plan. We, we surveyed the four gun positions in this angled wood there, as I say, all below the ground, and from the four positions we managed to cobble up a survey plan of a gun position, and that's the plan on the right hand side there. And what you have is the three main components, the gun pit, where the massive gun would be, the ammunition store on the left hand side, and the engine house on the right hand side which operated the whole process. Now we've recorded every minutiae detail on these sites that we can find and remember we're only seeing the, the upper surfaces uh, and you can see sort of details on the right hand side there. But there are two buildings nearby which stand above the ground and the one on the left is the command centre which would have operated the guns. The one in the, the middle picture there is a workshop and a building for some unknown purpose. We, you can see the type of survey plans we produce for these kind of buildings. The, the left hand picture shows the command centre with the, the cable ducts in the floor, that's the, and the green areas there marked, and that's the building down below. And then this big workshop with this massive H beam, um, unfortunately, not a lot other than the H-beam and the windows and doors surviving to tell us anything about what operations took place in there, but uh, at least we've got that information. Now, having done this survey and um, picked our way through all this stuff, clearing rubbish away and trees away, uh, and complimenting ourselves in this wonderful piece of work, we discovered that there are in fact sites like this identical to this which stand completely above the ground. And it's all there to be seen. So we did it the hard way. And this is a site at Barhead. There was four sites protecting the north side of the Clyde. One at Stocky Moor, one at Barhead, and one at Hamilton. Now here you can see the gun pit. Again, conveniently filled with modern rubbish. Uh, but the rooftop beside the gun pit in the left-hand picture is the ammunition store. So you can see the doors, the windows, the ventilators, every bit of detail you would want. But of course, ours is completely under the ground. So we didn't have access to all that information. The engine house, that's the internal photograph there. Uh, but again, there's not enough detail to show you how things worked. But we, at least we do know that. And the workshop in the other building is the bottom right-hand picture. And when you walk into this caravan park at Barhead, you'd never know that this existed. Except when you walk through 
And you see these other big concrete buildings standing up above the ground, beautifully preserved and identical in every shape and form to what we've recorded at Rosneath. And uh, we know the one at Stocking Moor is exactly the same again. So we did things the hard way. It's a good way to do things because you don't miss much. And um, it was an amazing uh, thing to discover that these were not, in fact, World War II, but uh, Cold War. And the owners of this site at Barhead were convinced they were World War II as well. OK, moving quickly on, back to World War II this time. And we've been recording HAA gun sites all around, along the north side of the coast from um, um, Dumbarton to the Rosneath Peninsula. And we have, in some cases, wonderful preservation, in other cases, not a iota of what the site was. It had been cleared away completely. But fortunately, for the purposes of this study, we've got masses and masses of information, photographs, actual books, handbooks, telling you how they operated these gun sites. Interestingly enough, at the beginning of the war, um, the guns were about as much good as no good at knocking down German aircraft. They had about a 5% chance of hitting an aeroplane uh, using the anti-aircraft guns. They had a better chance of di diverting the planes and confusing the, the, both the pilots and the bomb aimers with nothing other than a searchlight. So a searchlight at the beginning of the war was far more effective than a gun uh, to deter German bombers. But at the end of the war, thanks principally due to the development of radar, the, the efficiency went up to about 80%. The only problem now is there's no Germans born in Britain because we're at the end of the war. So anyway, that's how it worked. But we've got masses and masses of information. Now we're looking here at a site, a place called South Ailey, above the village of Cove on the southern tip of the peninsula. And you can see we're recording every detail. Light switches. This is a shower block on the right-hand side here. And it's probably for a male-only um, building because the showers are actually open to two sets of latrines, whereas the building on the left there has got two showers in it, but they're completely segregated. Se segregated. So one would probably be for the ATS, and the other half would be for the Royal Artillery, who operated the actual guns. Now, same site. Uh, the aerial photograph, wartime photograph, shows you the site. Um, I'm not quite sure, I can't just quite remember what the date of that photograph is. But there you have it, the camp on the right hand side, the guns on the left, and then this massive circular area which was the radar mark. Now if you take that photograph and invert it through 180 degrees, there's our survey plan at the top. The camp on the left hand side, the gun positions and the radar mark, and in the centre, the command centre. Again, underground for the most part, but perfectly preserved. And you can see here the gun position, one of the gun positions, and our survey plan uh, of these guns. The command centre uh, on two of our 11 sites are perfectly preserved. You can go underground and see them. And the orange area in the plan is the underground part. The dark grey area is the bit up above, which would always be exposed to the elements, and you have to remember that these sites were occupied 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. There was no taking time off, because that's when the German um, Luftwaffe would arrive. So we've, we've learned a lot about these buildings, and be, principally because of the photographs that are available. And here you can see the ATS uh, ladies operating this outdoor part. It's interesting that the men were indoor and the women were outdoor. I'm not quite sure. That's probably quite right. I don't know. Uh, anyway, <laughs> the, the, the dark grey areas show the, the rangefinder, the telescope, and the predictor. Now, the predictors in this bottom left-hand photograph here, these are, these are the world's first computers because the whole system worked by these spotters recording the planes as they were coming in, the radar, feeding the information downstairs into the plotters, and they fed the information to the guns, which worked automatically, fired automatically, and moved automatically to, to counteract the moving position of the bombers. They not only did that, but they fed the information to the next gun position along the coast. It's an amazing system, and it developed as the war progressed. Now, back now to World War I, 
and we are investigating a site there which I have to say has been investigated to death. Um, the area enclosed by red was actually an, an enclosure in the late 19th century. And of course, it, we immediately think, oh, it's World War I uh, military position, but it's nothing to do with World War I because it was built in the late 19th century not to combat the German nation, but the French nation, because they were scared that the French were going to attack the Clyde in the late 19th century. And four guns were positioned at Port Kill here, two six-inch guns, two four-inch guns, and a corresponding uh, uh, um, installation was built at Greenock called Fort Matilda. Now, nothing is left of Fort, P Fort Matilda, but the Port Kill site is a remark in a remarkable state of preservation. Because you can see the line of houses going up the red line there. Well, they're all sitting on top of the original gun positions, and they are in turn sitting on top of these underground chambers, which were the barracks, uh, the, the shell stores, and all oil stores and machinery stores, which operated this entire site. Now, a local chap from Cove has researched this site magnificently, and, and so has HES, and they've given us a lot of the information that we've got. So we're not too concerned about within the red area, but what nobody has done effectively is this little bit in the black area here, which was the camp site for World War I activity, as far as we know. And we've done a complete survey of what you see inside that plantation. But there you see one of the gun positions at the top of the hill with the holdfasts round the side, and of course, 21st century defence, not coastal, but the whole of Europe, the whole of NATO, uh, swimming down the Clyde there. So we've, uh, we've got a tremendous lot to talk about in terms of military. Now, this is just some views. In one of these underground chambers beside the gun positions, the original iron staircase coming down, and left and right of that are, are barracks areas and storage areas for the shells. And above the door, um, I've not got my specs, I think it says Shell Lobby. Can you make it out above the door on the bottom right hand side here? So there's inscriptions inside the building, still there, to tell you what each room was used for. Light fittings still, not light fittings, but light installations, electrical installations there as well. And as I say, we're recording all them. But one of the most remarkable things about this site is the two people in the middle there are standing side by side against a shell hoist. Now this is an old timber construction running up through the building from the ammunition store below to the gun positioned above. You can even see the handle on it and that's survived there since World War I. It's incredible. And there's two of these positions. Why this is not a scheduled ancient monument, a monument in care, I will never know because the preservation is just extraordinary. Now the great thing about this particular site is in queue in the, the public records office, the, almost the complete architectural drawings survive. It's showing all the detail of the, the, the buildings here. You can see this here. Now, two or three of these buildings still survive. They've been renovated into modern houses, but all the original features around them are still there. And the, the, every single room is marked out to whatever the purpose was. Interestingly, this building here has got a WC, a lavatory, and a latrine. So <laughs> they're well cared uh, uh, for, for that. And um, the, 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 the map on the right-hand side shows the position down here beside the coast. It also had searchlight positions, which we've not looked at yet. But... It had outstations all around the hills at the back to the north. And these are called blockhouses. And each one of these had a latrine building and various ditches. Uh, so these are World War I um, trenches uh, around these sites. And we're going to be investigating them by excavation very soon. But they were a sort of outflanking defence so that the, the, the site was protected from the landward side as opposed to the seaward side. The two guns in the bottom right hand are the type of guns that were in that uh, installation, but they're guns which survive way up the north of Shetland. 
So they are not our guns, they, but it's brilliant that they do actually survive up there. But what's interesting is we've also got some photographs to the site, and the photograph in the middle shows men pulling a gun barrel away up the hill to build the guns. Now you would think they would have put it in some sort of undercarriage or, you know, and pulled it up with horses. And there's a name there, it's called par buckling. I don't know if anybody's heard of that. It's a new word to me. It simply means pulling heavy weights. Par buckling, a 4.7 inch gun uh, to position in Kilcreggan 4. The man handled the gun barrels up the hill. It's quite, it's quite extraordinary. Anyway, so we've, we've got masses and masses of information on, on this site. And we've looked up in the hills. A lot of these sites have just disappeared, dissolved away into the landscape. But we do find traces here and there. And we're going to be investigating them. But remember I said the black area, uh, as opposed to the red area in the, in the installation. Well, that's it in the bottom right, left-hand side there. Now, this is a War Department plan. But I now call it a sketch. Because although we have that, the whole area is completely overgrown in woodland and we've been chopping down trees and stripping the ground back to try and refine these buildings uh, on the ground. And we've done it. We've done, been pretty successful in doing that. And we've got a survey now uh, which shows what we've achieved compared to what they said was there. Now, I just spoke to a certain gentleman uh, before I gave the talk and I said, We've done this survey and we can't fit the buildings in. And he tells me that they can. So, we need to compare notes. HES have given us a lot of information. We are now supplying a lot of new information. But our survey is in the middle there. And it shows the various buildings. And if you look at them, for instance, uh, this building here seems to be three buildings. But in fact, in reality, it's a single building there. But at least they do tell us it was a cookhouse. The building below that, number C in our plan, uh, is not identified in the War Department plan, but we know exactly what that is. It's a boiler room on the right-hand side and a 20-man shower block on the left-hand side because we've excavated it and got all the details of the, the shower compartments and stuff like that. Now, the problem for us, which uh, Alan's going to solve for us uh, the next time I meet him, is that we couldn't fit these long yellow buildings, presumably the barrack buildings, on to these uh, concrete posts which survive on the site. Very few of them actually survive in situ, but there's a complete row surviving there. And it's got, a sort of, if you like, a mate there, and we think it was a double row uh, which would have supported one of these long barrack blocks. Now, try as I might, I can't get anything to fit in accurately uh, because we've, we've got the concrete um, basis for the buildings which are reality we've got existing pillars some of them um, which again are real reality in situ but I can't make these buildings fit so I'll look forward to seeing your plan in due course uh, but much of the site has been obliterated you can see a whole corner has been chopped off uh, down here and incorporated again into the modern field so we've um, We're, we're, we're still got a wee bit of work to do in that area, but this is all sort of, if you like, new information on the camp, the World War I camp for the Port Kill Battery. Now, I just put this up. I'm not a political person, but we record everything of military issue in our area. This was a, a bit of graffiti on the swimming pool at Helensborough that appeared for a very short time. The authorities got rid of it pretty quick. But I'm just going to make a political point. This sums up the whole business to me perfectly. We're talking about recording military um, guns to shoot people down. What we're talking about is killing people. That's what this is all about. That's what warfare is all about. It's not about gun positions and barrack blocks and this, that and the next. It's about people, people actually killing each other. And we should never lose sight of that fact. And I think this sums it up beautifully. The futility, the utter stupidity of warfare and um, the enormous cost uh, that, that, that it incurs on populations, both in financial terms, but more importantly, we're all wearing poppies in human terms. 
So we should never lose sight of that. It's the most important thing about this whole sort of project. So you're paying, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I'll leave you with that political point. Thanks very much. Thank you.